beat the step. Step right up and greet the Mets. Bring your kiddies, bring your wife. Guaranteed to have the time of your life because the Mets are really sucking the ball. Knocking those home runs over the wall. East side, west side. Everybody's coming down to meet the M-E-T-S Mets of New York Town. Oh, the butcher and the baker and the people on the streets. Where do they go? To meet the Mets. Oh, they're hollering and cheering and they're jumping in their seats. Where do they go? And we are live, Mets and baseball fans overall. Thank you all so much for chiming in for the latest live stream here on Wardy NYM, where we will be breaking down all the latest news and rumors regarding the Amazons over the past couple days, and especially today as we are going to deep dive all the takeaways from the presser for the new manager, that being and Buck Showalter. We will also be bringing on a special guest, that being in our good friend Joe DeMeo from SNY and the co-host of the That's So Mets podcast. He'll be coming in right around the halfway mark or so into this stream, depending on how long we go on. He'll be breaking down his thoughts and his analysis on Buck and really what is next for the Mets, some options for them in the coaching staff-wise, including potentially a Carlos Beltran reunion. We'll be getting into some more of the rumor mill as well with some players that we could potentially see land in Queens once the lockout is lifted, but a lot to get into in tonight's live stream, whether you're watching this live or on replay. So I want to thank everyone so much for first chiming in, folks. I want to give a roll call quick to everyone that's first chiming in live. That being in John, Sports Updates, Miguel, Carlos, D, Neil, uh, New Yorker, Ashford, Nick, John, um, Buzz Talk, Guardians of Chaos, Ethan, uh, David, Aora, uh, George, great member on the channel, Nexus, Hope, Roblox, Tim, great friend and member on the channel. All you guys, Miles, Brennan, Ray, as you all first chime in, and Mama Worm, everybody, thank you guys so much for chiming in. Like I said, we have a lot to get into tonight. I'm really excited. A great conversation. And yes, a big highlight of this is definitely going to be about Buck Showalter and his presser today, along with plenty of other topics regarding what is next for the Mets overall this offseason. So let's start to deep dive this one, folks. Again, if you're just chiming in, Edward, great member on the channel, uh, the rookie card guy, John, Thank you all so much, guys. And again, please make sure to smash that like and subscribe button if you guys are new to the live stream, new to the channel, especially help us get a 13K subs. That's the next short-term goal for the largest Mets-centric content here on YouTube that isn't actually directly affiliated with the Mets or SNY. Um, so we've been doing great things. Help us get to 300 likes by the end of the stream. Always appreciate it, but let's get 100 likes for the first short-term goal. John Array with a $5 donation. John, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Same sport. Love your content. Well, I love you, my man. Thank you so much. Really, really does mean a lot. Hope you're doing well, John. Thank you so much again for the donation. Hype in chat for my boy. And Sandy, great member on the channel. Anthony, how's it going? Ari, all you guys that are first chiming in. Really appreciate you guys. Like I said, we have a lot to discuss today. And I could easily go this entire live stream. I could easily go over an hour straight on just the Buck Showalter presser in itself. I will not be doing that, however. But we are going to discuss really what, I, in my mind, were the key takeaways today. I watched the entire thing. I watched right after that when he was on SNY. I listened in parts when he was on um, not just MLB Network, but also when he was with the Michael K show um, over the radio today. So I've been listening to Buck all day long and just like many of you Mets fans I am pretty damn excited I gotta be honest with you 
first and foremost what buck show walter did for me today and for most Mets fans is that he had an absolute slam dunk of a presser. This felt awfully similar to Billy Upper's first introduction as GM for the New York Mets this offseason. Both of them respectively. I really don't think you could ask for anything better to get out of them for their presser. Now we're going to see what, of course, Buck does. And again, he has a lot of things that he has to answer once the season begins. But so far, so good. I really left smiling the entire time. And for someone that I can openly say was not in love with the idea of Buck Showalter originally coming in as manager over the past couple months when his name first circled out there. But really, I have come full circle, and I can't even I can't even emphasize that enough. Truly, how much I admire the man and how getting to know him, understand him better, not just as a manager, as a person, how he operates, that has definitely helped influence me for the better. And I know it has for a lot of you guys too. So I'm I'm pleasantly surprised to a certain extent with certain things, but. Again, for the more seasoned fans that have experienced Buck, especially when he was a manager last time in New York with the Yankees, you guys know very well on really Buck, a lot of things about his personality, really what he can bring to a team as a manager, right? So I'm excited to get into this one. Again, folks, we have a lot to deep dive on this presser and the takeaways. And he was on Carney Roberts. I didn't I didn't check that one out I from working today, too. I just saw when he was on other ones outside of his actual presser today. But that's cool to see he was on Carden. Um, Gabe, thank you so much for the $5 donation. Really appreciate that. Uh, Brett Beatty and Dominic Smith and J.D. Davis for Jose Ramirez and Zach Plesak. Really appreciate the um, the uh, donation, my friend. And while J-Ram will definitely cost you an arm and a leg, I don't see that happening. I still think that you have to give up quite a bit more just for Jose Ramirez, to be quite honest with you. At least a little bit more. And I don't see the Mets parting the ways with Brett Beatty. I really don't. I think that they know that that is their third baseman of the future until proven otherwise. So I would be very surprised to see him dealt at this point in time with an expectation that he could hit the bigs as soon as this upcoming season, whether it's down the stretch or earlier in the year. And Joe DeMeo is going to expand on that a little bit too when he comes in because he just came out with his prospect rankings not that long ago. And he talked about Brett Beatty and really the expectation for him in 2022. So appreciate the donation a lot, Gabe. Again, guys, smash that like and subscribe on as you're first coming in. I'm a little parched when we get some water here, then we'll get underway, right? And shout out to my good friend Dave, who's a great supporter and friend on the channel, who sent me this mug a while ago. Has Wardy there, right? Has Wardy here. Love it. Okay, folks. Um, when will the lockout end? I, I wish I had an answer. D, thank you so much for the $2 donation. Sending some support. Great time to be a Mets fan. That's an understatement, D. Again, thank you so much for the donation. I really appreciate that. Um, Okay, folks, so let's talk about the Buck Showalter presser, shall we? My oh my, what a presser this was for the New York Mets, right? To have Buck Showalter come in, and right away, you could tell that this man was excited. And again, this was one of those X factors that I said between not just himself, but really separating himself from the rest of the managerial candidates. Nothing against Cotrero, Espada, et cetera, outside of the top three that were interviewed out of the overall six. Nothing against any of them whatsoever. But outside of the experience, outside of, you know, what it takes to win, the Bucks really drive at this point in his career is something that just feels a little unprecedented. You know, Buck wasn't going to come in and be the manager for just any team in the MLB. He said in today's presser, he's drawn to teams that he feel will have consistent success, right? And that's something that he feels will happen with the New York Mets here. This is his last two raw. I don't expect Buck Showalter to manage any other team in his career. It's it's now or never, right, for them to really push for a championship. And he ex is exactly coming back to New York coming full circle in his career when he started with the Yankees back in the early 90s to hopefully cap off his career to get a championship on his resume and go off into the sunset as hopefully a Hall of Famer, right? But Buck is not a guy that would be a manager for just any club, and that's really a difference between himself, his drive, and really just going all in right now versus someone like an Espada, a Cotrero, guys that were also available for the Oakland A's managerial position. They Neither of them won that position, actually, so I don't know if they'll be going back to their own clubs as their bench coaches, respectively, or whatever happens, but those are two guys that would really like to be manager for most teams in the league. Buck is not one of those, so I'm really excited to get into here, folks, because one thing that was made abundantly clear right in the beginning and the presser from Billy Upper himself was that one of the biggest emphasis, the key factors in the landing Buck Showalter is his ability to be adaptive, right? You know, his to have the adaptability to come in even at the age of 65, turning 66 in spring, and knowing that he's not going to be the same manager that he was in the past. He knows that the MLB is not what it was just a couple of years ago. He knows what it's not what it was back in, you know, the 90s and the 2000s. The managerial position has changed 
quite a bit throughout his entire tenure as a coach in the MLB. He's fully aware, and he said it best, it's adapt or die. And that's what I love because a lot of people, including myself initially, one of our biggest concerns with Buck Showalter coming in as manager was, how is he going to be able to operate? Is he going to be able to come in and really put, you know, not necessarily his ego aside, but to put himself in a position where he's not going to overstep things when he knows he needs to be collaborative. He needs to be adaptive with the front office and the remainder of the coaching staff in order to have success. And that's exactly what he's doing. That's exactly what he preached. And that was one of the biggest factors in the Mets deciding on him, which I thought was great to see. Because normally when you think of an old school manager, old school coach, old school person of any notion, right? Naturally, they might be a little bit more stubborn. That's just history tells you that when I think of plenty of older school minds that we've seen in, in the MLB. It's not often that you see someone that's willing to be fully open minded, that's willing to be fully adaptive and collaborative. Buck Walter is that. He's kind of an anomaly in that in that aspect of things. And I really appreciate about him. And I know a lot of you guys too. So Buck, again, to come in for one of those factors to be his adaptability, I absolutely love that. And I also love the fact that on how how Billy Upward went about this process because one of the key notes that I saw that I want to make sure I pull up on my phone here was that Billy Upward said um, candidates were all put through breakout sessions when it came to actually going for the managerial position where they worked with the analytics and scouting department to pardon me, analytics and scouting departments to see how the collaboration would effectively work. So clearly if the Mets were not feeling comfortable about how collaborative or lack thereof that buck would be, Joe Espada or Matt Cotrero would be the manager right now, not Buck Showalter. So he clearly checked off all the boxes. And Sandy Olsen and Billy said it themselves. They were asked a question. I think it was from Deja uh, Thozar, who, who's on the beat for the Mets, who does a good job. Um, and she asked, you know, is this really a 10 out of 10 hire? I don't know if it was her or someone else. Regardless, and both Billy and Sandy agreed, yeah, this is as close to, you know, this is the best example of a 10 out of 10 hire that you could expect. And something that I was actually not aware of, which was pleasant here, was that back in going for the 95 season, Sandy Olsen, when he was running the show for the Oakland A's, did try to get Buck Showalter as his manager. Buck ended up going to the Arizona Diamondbacks, as we know, had great success there on the short term before he then left. And of course, they won the World Series the following year because that always happens with uh, teams that Buck has coached, right? Uh, but all jokes aside, um, he has always viewed highly a Buck Showalter. And as we said endlessly on the channel in regards to Billy Epler, same thing can be said. Billy Epler in his final year as owner with the LA Angels was in a win-now stage, final year in his contract, and he knew that he needs someone that could really help them get success right away. And he felt that was Buck Showalter. As we know, Artie Marino, the owner for the Angels, and I, I've had my fair share of words about him. I'm not going to expand further. One with Joe Madden instead, previously with the Chicago Cubs, and look at where they are to this point. So clearly, Billy Epler, Sandy, they both wanted Showalter respectively for a number of years, and they weren't going to pass up the opportunity to land him a second time around or a third time, depending on the opportunities that have been present throughout their tenures in front offices. So this is something that really has felt inevitable. And I know that it didn't seem like it was a for certain thing at times because you had to give the right respect to the Contreras, the Espadas of the world. But it really seemed from the beginning, as we all said, and as I said plenty, it was Buck's job to lose. So to see the Mets, Sandy Billy joking, you know, smiling, looking at Buck and all having a good time in the press are saying that, yeah, like he's the guy, he's 10 out of 10. You really could not go any better than him. He checks off every single box of what we are looking for in a manager right now. I personally absolutely love that. I'm, I'm sure many of you guys do too. But be, before I go further, because I have a lot more to say on this before we get Joe in here, I want to thank everyone again for first time in the live stream, folks. Make sure to smash that like and subscribe on. I was getting 100 likes for the first short-term goal. Going to address a couple donations quick, and then we will go forward here. Um <clears throat> Um, Michael, yes, I do know about the Fan Nation article. I actually have it pulled up right next to me because that's my buddy Pat Regazzo who we had on the channel or during our last uh, late, uh, latest Mets news and rumors live stream. So, yeah, I'll be referencing Pat plenty today. Uh, Duran, thank you so much for your $2 donation. I appreciate that. You think Buck could fix Diaz uh, mentally? I mean, I don't know exactly how much there – I shouldn't say that. Obviously, there are some mental issues with Diaz with being consistent, right? Because we all know he has a stuff. I do think that Buck can, of course, bring some upside to someone like Diaz, especially given a guy that has had the amount of extensive experience as he has. Yeah, I do think that is this can potentially build him well. I don't think it's going to hurt him. Let me put it that way. I think Buck is going to instill trust in him, but also realistic trust where, you know, Diaz can 
feel comfortable, but knowing that he needs to get the job done night in and night out. Maybe a different feeling than what he's had previously with the Rojas is the Cowboys of the world, right? But again, thank you so much for the donation. I appreciate that, Duran. And Doug Lloyd, new member on the channel. Thank you so much, Doug. Appreciate that. Hype in the chat for Doug for becoming a new member here in Wardy NYM. Means a lot. Thank you so much for that. And again, and like I said many times, guys, I'm going to be getting into plenty of your questions towards the end of the live stream. We'll be opening things up there. Um, but I do want to shout out Dominic, who's a great member on the channel that's in here right now, who is too kind to send my way. I haven't even seen this type of Piazza jersey before. Dominic has sent many things my way in the past. He sent a David Wright authentic jersey. He sent the Andy Chavez signed uh, photo, the catch behind me as well. He's been a great supporter. But here we have... Look at this beautiful. It, it literally looks like it hasn't even been worn. It's it's stunning. Authentic Mike Piazza jersey. So shout out to Dominic. I, I just saw this in the P.O. Box today. Got the patches going. It's just absolutely fantastic. Fan flip fantastic. So again, thank you so much, Dominic. It really does mean the world to me. I love the I love the side with the royal blue too. Just absolutely sick. Absolutely sick. So thank you again, Dominic. Love and appreciate you, my friend. Um, when is the giveaway? The giveaway already happened, Stephen. Posted that on the community tab because it was only it was only a week after when I posted that. Um, the winners have already been announced. Um, but yes, shout out to you, Dominic. Thank you again. Really, really appreciate that. Um, okay, folks. So let's get further in this presser because it's really important that we touch certain topics here. So Buck is all for using analytics. And this was something that was a narrative that we thought about a while, especially especially Mets fans, including myself, that did not have as much of a knowledge about the man as I do now. Where Buck, old school, how adaptive is he going to be with analytics? Well, he further preached today that he is quote-unquote spongeful, even though that isn't really a word. He made a word today and saying how, yeah, I'm very spongeful to analytical information. And he also reaffirmed that we are not going to have it where we lose games because we felt that the opposing team had a better advantage. And he made something abundantly clear in today's presser, which I think is so important as well. You're getting awfully close to 100 likes, so thank you guys for the support as always, folks. Help us get there. Um, but when it comes to his time in Baltimore, he was with them, of course, for right around eight, uh, seven or eight seasons, right? He did not have the funding from ownership, obviously, to really have a deep analytics department at all. He said, we would have loved to have a deeper analytics department, but we simply, the funding wasn't there. And he said the same thing for having, I think, um, I think another department in regards to um, Hispanics. I, I'm, I'm almost certain it was something along those lines in regards to, uh, you know, Spanish players, just having a department to make things that I don't know if it has to do with, you know, translation or just getting them comfortable, you know, acclimate, especially if they're coming as an international prospect or something. But he said that it was all it was all mindful and good, but we just didn't have the funding. He's really excited now because he doesn't just have Steve. He has both Steve and Alex Cohen, Alex's wife, that are really opening the floodgates for the Mets to do whatever they want. They have an analytics department that's already 30 plus people and growing, which is just mind boggling considering where it was just a couple years ago. Everything that they are building right now is something that Buck has never been able to use before, not nearly to the same degree. And look at the success that Buck has had in his career while working with so minimal certain things, so minimal departments, right? So he's excited about that. I love that for him too. And I think that's going to be huge for the Mets for a guy that even at the age of 65, he is ready to be fully adaptive. He is not pushing away the analytics whatsoever. He's not going to act like he knows everything analytically, but he's going to ask so many questions for people respectfully within his coaching staff, people in front office that he hopes that it's it's going to reach a point where you know they're tired of him. They're sick and tired of him. He's ready to go. He wants to ask away all these questions, and all he wants to do is really be a manager for his players and, of course, the fans. But he knows his role. He's here for not a long time, but a fun time short term he knows that what his position is with the manager for the new york mets to have success right away and they got to win at the end of the day that's all that matters and he's really reiterated that when he's coming in here now with these players he wants to do whatever he possibly can to help them that's literally all he cares about he's not coming in and trying to make everyone a conformist he made that abundantly clear too he wants everyone to have their personality he doesn't want to push down personalities or anything like that and he also has made it known that accountability is huge too. And that's something when we talk about the culture change that the Mets have built this offseason, right? When you think about this culture change, when you think about the additions and the subtractions, Buck made it known in this presser 
that he won loves the type of players that they have brought in additions wise not just because of their talent but the character that they bring these are veterans that have had success already but know how to really establish a strong locker room presence and the cannas the martes the scherzers the escobars etc that's all going to bode well and they've been spoken glowingly of by numerous people within the industry on their impact not just talent wise but again character wise and he also said how additions might i mean subtractions might also be your best addition so it wasn't it wasn't a shot at a specific player but when you think of the type of players that the mets have part with this offseason there are some certain individuals that i think you guys can put two and two together that we're a little bit more outspoken that were deemed by certain people even within the mets organization and s and y that felt that they were really more of a problem a negative than a positive in this clubhouse so Buck is fully on board with what they're doing, and he knows that accountability isn't for everyone. So it's going to be important to see who um, who it's for and who it ain't. And I don't know exactly what that is going to mean in the sense of if someone's going to be stubborn and they're going to try to you know sway his mind and get him on the page, or they're simply going to be in a position where, hey, if you're not going to be riding with us in this way, then we're going to just part with you. It's no, it's no sweat off our back. So he's going to get everyone on the same page and make sure that everyone has the same level of accountability and respect game in and game out. There isn't going to be a drastic difference throughout the season. I think when we look at the Mets this entire past season in 2021, it was just all these ebbs and flows of positivity, negativity, positivity, negativity, negativity, especially the second half. It really felt like it was all negativity, right? So for the Mets to do what they're doing now, to build the culture that they're building, we all had the idea of the type of culture out there going down prior to hiring Buck, but now that they bring in Buck, it just further reaffirms everything on what they're doing as a complete 180 to what we've seen, not just in 2021, but in recent years with this clubhouse and with the talent on the field and what we can expect from them. Dominic, oh, that, that makes sense. It looks untouched. So again, Dom, thank you so much for the jersey. Know how much I appreciate it. And we're close to 100 likes again. Thank you guys for the support. Always appreciate you guys. Um, Shout out to Anthony, a great friend and subscriber on the channel. All you guys, shout out to you all. But, yeah, I got so much more to say on this presser, guys. I really do. But let me actually put a poll up in the stream right now because I'm curious what everyone's stances are in regards to this presser. Okay, I got the poll running in the chat. There we go. Okay. Now, let's see. I got a bunch of notes right here. Okay. Um, Let's see. Okay. When talking about the Mets this past season, he Buck made it simply put, you know, there, there's no excuse. You know, we can talk about the injuries. We can talk about this and that. And everyone has their fair share of opinions, and rightfully so. Everyone deserves those. You know, at, at the end of the day, that only means so much, right? We have to bury. We have to cut out all the BS possible, excuse wise, in order to get this team to win on a night nightly basis, day in and day out. I love that because when you think about if, say, it was a different hire, someone else coming in, or even you know, I just think of Brody Van Wagenen, for instance, on saying that like. He feels like he would have been the type to say, oh, you know, we had all these injuries this past year, but rest assured, next season, everyone fully healthy. They're going to be, you know, the best team in the division. Buck isn't saying that. He said, look, at the end of the day, there is no ma magic, uh, you know, fairy dust when it comes to winning in the MLB, right? If you're a playoff team, you deserve to be there. If you weren't a playoff team, you clearly don't deserve to be there. So we're not going to dwell on the past. It's, it's important to view that and to help you build on for the better but we're going to focus on the now and how we can address things and how I as manager can address things to the best of my abilities for each and every one in the clubhouse, whether you're the big name superstars and the Jacob de Grom's or Francisco and the Max Scherzer's of the world, or if you're someone that is, you know, of lower status, we all want to have everyone on the same page here, but we also want people to understand that we can't look at all these excuses as to valid reasons as to why we're not having success. We need to fight this adversity battle through it and not hang our heads low because of what's transpired in the past. It's time to move forward. And I really appreciate that about Buck as well. And it just, 
really what I appreciate probably most more than anything out of this entire presser was Buck just reaffirming that, you know, there is no excuses. He was, you know, he wasn't beating around the bush at all. He was telling you how it was. And that's what people love Buck Showalter for. You know, he's a charismatic type personality, not just as a human being, but also as a manager and in that clubhouse and on the field and the bench, um, you know, in the, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, in the dugout. But he's someone that comes in and is going to tell you how it is. And I think that's really going to bode well for, you know, a harsh reality at times for players. But knowing that he's simply trying to do everything he possibly can to benefit this team and benefit them individually. He is by all means a player first type manager. He's not someone, like I said, that's going to come in and try to change players, make them different than what they are, not for the better, but for the worse. So that way their role is potentially better on the club, even though that doesn't make sense, right? So how his approach is going to be with the Mets is pivotal. He looks excited. He looks happy to be here. I'm excited about that. And he views the Mets as a precious team, a precious situation to be in. And he's grateful to be in it. And you can tell that just smiling ear to ear throughout the entire presser, throughout all the conversations he's had so far publicly, that he's in a he's in a position right now where he knows exactly what his role is, but he also knows why we should be so hyped up about what the future is going to be. And, you know, he said, simply put, again, you know, we're going to leave it all out there every single game no matter what, and we're going to see what happens. So a couple more things I want to address here before we get Joe DeMeo in to talk further on Buck Showalter and talk a lot more on other topics too. Thank you guys for 100 likes. Appreciate that. Just a couple hundred more to 300 in the live stream. Um, going to touch on a couple more things. I just want to make sure I'm not missing any key points because there was a lot. Like I said, I wrote down a lot. I'm looking at, um, at an article from my guy, Pat Ragazzo too, to make sure I'm not missing anything important as well. Um, let's see. And Buck's wariness of just being in the market, you know, he made it known that it's you're going to be known if you're in, a fake, right? If you're not true to what you say you are in New York more than anywhere else. He experienced that during his time with the Yankees. He knows what the market is like. So I, I just, I think it's awesome to see that he's fully aware on the position that he's in right now, depending on who would be hired. They very well could not understand the proper expectations, especially for a guy like Buck expectations are going to be through the roof as soon as the season starts. This is a team that's expected to win and it starts in 2022 and beyond, right? So we all know the amount of immense pressure he's going to have on his shoulders, but how is how his portrayal is going to be about this on a game-to-game -game basis? While they're definitely going to have their ups and downs throughout the season, there's definitely going to be times where we're complaining like no tomorrow about Buck. That's inevitable with any manager, any coach that you have. It's always going to happen. But rest assured, how his vision is, for what the Mets vision is, it seems like that this is a great pair to have success, especially with balancing the old school aspect, the culture aspect, the mentality aspect, and also with the analytics, the new age type baseball, and really meshing them together to get that best balance to really have your best performance on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I, again, I just, I cannot say enough how excited I am about Buck and coming from someone that did not have nearly as much excitement a month ago. You can tell that I've not just been swayed. I've been beyond that. So I'm all, I'm all on the buck train. I really am. I think that he sold himself perfectly. And when you look at his track record, what he's done so far, why exactly hasn't he won when teams have won as soon as he left? There are valid reasons behind those things. And I feel comfortable saying that Buck probably would have won at least one championship if he wasn't uh, if he didn't wasn't cut loose from the Yankees shorter than what it should have been, right? So, and there were obvious reasons as to why that transpired having to do with the lockout and his coaching staff and not wanting to part with certain guys. So just standing up for what he believed in, what was best for that team. And I respect that. Um, but he also emphasized prep for the short uh, spring training. And this is something that I don't think a lot of Mets and baseball fans are realizing. Buck's been through multiple lockouts already. He understands that aspect. He unfortunately has dealt through that. And it's been, it's weighed on him before, but he's already trying to figure out how to get the team prepped in a scenario where they have a short and spring training. He obviously hopes, I obviously hope, we all obviously hope that there isn't a short and spring training, but you need to make sure that you're ready sooner than later in case we do have ourselves a situation like that where it's a short and spring and then bam, the season starts. So if there is another benefit that you can look at, a surprising benefit, is that Buck has dealt with the lockout aspect as a manager in the MLB already. Not once, but twice, I believe. So that's going to benefit the Mets too here in preparation to get the seasons going and hopefully have everyone on the same page ready to go in 2022. Um, all right, see a couple donations. I'm going to address some quick folks, and then we're going to bring our good friend Joe DeMeo here in the live stream, and we got plenty more to talk about. John, thank you so much for the $5 donation. Really appreciate that. 
what lovely said about main, uh, maintaining leads and that he de- he and, and par me and that how demoralizing it is to lose leads so you know he is going to push to get more pitching oh absolutely yeah Mets aren't done with moves he's aware of that and you know he's I, I'm really excited for him and hopefully you know securing leads that'll be huge but also get just getting the Mets constantly rise to scoring position we all know offensively what the Mets need this year we all know um, pitching wise what the Mets need all these things and I, I think Buck knows that very well too uh, Pat Mets Thank you so much for the $20 donation. Really means a lot. Hype in the chat for Pet Mets. He's been an awesome supporter on the channel, as always. Thank you so much, my friend. Hope you're doing well. In another world, I would like Terry Collins as bench coach. Imagine two great baseball minds working together. With that said, Joe McEwing or uh, Tim Bogar are smart baseball people I would like to see on the bench. I don't know if I'm going to see either of consideration. I think Joe maybe. I don't necessarily know about Tim. Um, and that's just my gut talking right now. I don't really have anything to back it. Um, I will, it'll be interesting to see who will end up as bench coach for the Mets. There's a lot of different routes that they can go down. And obviously the biggest route, the most controversial route that we'll be discussing in tonight's live stream is yes, Carlos Beltran, how realistic, unrealistic that is that type of thing. But pet Mets, thank you so much again for the donation. Really, really appreciate that. And again, appreciate all you guys are first chiming in the live stream folks. But with that being said, we're going to get Joe in. So give me one second, everybody. Okay, folks, question everybody in the chat right now. Are you, I don't know, what's the poll looking at? Actually, let me check the poll real quick before we go further. And getting closer to 200 likes rate. Thank you guys for the support. Love and appreciate it, guys, always. 95% of you guys so far out of over 100 votes in the poll and only 10 minutes up are satisfied with Bucks pressure today. <laughs> I think it's going to probably stay in that 90 plus range. Um, that, that feels kind of obvious, right? Um, Tim, what's up, my man? All right, folks. Joe, you hear me? Yeah, what's going on? How are we doing? Awesome. Man? Awesome. How's it going, my man? How are you? Everything's great. Everything's good. Good. You hear me fine? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I don't know if you might want to scoot a little bit just so that you're a little bit better in the frame at all. The, yeah, there you go. Just because I want to keep everything in the middle so that way people, yeah. people know the talking points. But yeah, guys, you all probably know Joe by now. He's been on the channel multiple times before, you know, talking Mets with prospects, which is what he's known for, covering the Mets prospects for SNY. Also has a great Mets podcast with Connor Rogers for the That's So Mets podcast. The link's in the description, everything below, guys. So please make sure to check out Joe if you haven't already. But we're going to deep dive a lot, Joe. I've been talking about this presser for Buck Showalter. So let's just get right into it. Like, one, what's your initial reaction to Buck being hired? How surprised or not surprised were you with him landing with the Mets? And really, what has your take been on him since he has arrived now with the Mets? Wasn't surprised really at all. Like, I think the other candidates, Joe Espada and Matt Quattraro, were good candidates that are going to be big league managers sometime soon. Uh, I think Buck was always the Mets guy. If he didn't go and bomb the interview process, I think they wanted someone with experience. They wanted someone that's been there and done that in that city. Uh, I think it's something that Steve Cohen wanted. Think about Billy Epler. Billy Epler was a guy that was in New York. Buck Showalter, a guy that's been in New York. He doesn't. He didn't want to make some hires of people that weren't comfortable with the city, didn't know the city. So I think it, it made a lot of sense for it. And the presser, to me, fired me up. I thought he was great. Uh, I thought his energy level was the biggest thing that st- stood out to me was multiple times. It was probably seven, eight, nine times. Uh, he was going on a tangent about whatever the question was. And then he was like, sorry, you just got me going. Like, he's so fired up to be back in this job. It's not just like, oh, I'm happy to be here. This is great. You know, glad for the opportunity. Like, he's fired up and I'm I'm now fired up because of it. Yeah, I mean, I found myself in that same category. And that was something that I was preaching for a bit, too. And really, what would be an X factor for him versus, say, Couture or Espada? They're looking to be a manager at any team in the league right now you know buck is not that guy at this point in his career he's very going to be very selective on where he would land if at all he want to go to a team that he feels has best chance to win starting 2022 and for him to be 
65, 66 in spring and to have that fire under him, you know, you that just feels infectious. And I think that's going to resonate so well with the clubhouse right away as soon as he starts getting acclimated. And I know that he can't really talk to players yet, even though they did slip up with some names during the presser, which I thought was I was hilarious. I was looking at um his wife right away and you could she was just eyeing him so hard. Like, you can't say the names, which is yeah. just so stupid in my mind, too. It's absolutely the stupidest thing in the world. All right. We understand there's a lockout. But yeah. we're going to pretend that the players don't exist. Like, give me a break. It, it's kind of ridiculous. It is ridiculous. You know what? You know what's also ridiculous? That hat. I got to be honest. With you. The amount of slander you were getting this in this live stream universally <laughs> for that hat is why hilarious people, to me. Why do people hate first place teams? I don't quite get it. <laughs> You're the same guy that wears a Jets outfit. I mean, not a Jets outfit, a Cowboys outfit when you go to a Jets game. Am I wrong? That, no, that's facts. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm a steel I'm a Steelers fan, so like I, I just don't like the Cowboys because they they were the two biggest teams back yeah. in the day, especially right. You know, I I don't appreciate that Super Bowl loss either. But you know, I'm getting on to the Giants game. fans listening, so sorry. <laughs> um, but but game game back on to baseball talk for a bit. So you know, now that Bucks in place here. What were some other key takeaways that pop in your head right away from this presser? Because for me, it was a couple of things that I think the first thing that just really I was excited about and what was the biggest concern, biggest question mark for most Mets fans was that, you know, how adaptive, how collaborative is he going to be with this front office and his entire coaching staff, right? Well, right away, Billy Epler made it known that, you know, his ability to be that adaptive was a huge X factor in really choosing him as well. So what's kind of your take on just his ability at his age to kind of be an anomaly? Because normally when you think of old school coaches, old school people in front office, they might be a little stubborn and just wanting to stick with what works and what's worked in the past for them, not necessarily want to change more to today's game. So what's your take on all that and overall other takeaways that you noticed from today's presser? Yeah, I was impressed that, you know, he seemed so open to collaboration because that was one of my questions that I had brought up. And it was just a question, not one... Like, I think a lot of people confuse, like, having questions with thinking he definitely won't be a certain way. I had no idea. I don't know Buck Showalter. So I was just like, I know what his kind of history suggests. Is he willing to be collaborative? And by all accounts, seems like that answer is yes. Um, has he embraced analytics? Like, enough for me. I don't need Buck Showalter to come on and explain to me what weighted runs created plus is. Exactly. Like, I don't need him to do that. That's what they hire 25, 30, like this massive analytics department. That's what they're hiring those people for. Uh, I think Buck just needs to be willing to take the information that he gets, which, you know, he was very wise to point out that, you know, taking information is something he's always done. Like it just was maybe more simplified because obviously where analytics have gone in the game. Uh, so I thought he came off as a guy that's ready to do maybe a different phase and I think back to Terry Collins, when the Mets brought Terry Collins in, it was, he's too intense. A lot of players don't like him. Like there was many reports of players that did not like Terry Collins in his previous managerial spots. He came to the Mets and he knew it was his last managerial job. So like we saw kind of a different Terry Collins than when he was maybe in his like prime as a manager and the players love Terry. So I think you're going to see a different Buck given Buck probably knows this is this is the last shot doing this. Yeah, I, I agree with that one too. It seems like, you know, there was no, I said this all along, there was no shot in hell that Buck would even be of consideration if he was going to come in and be rather stubborn, you know, and say, you know, I need, I need to run things my way if you want me. You know, it's about you want me, not me wanting to be here. Like, none of that would have happened. So I think that that was one of, if not the most refreshing thing from this all, to just see someone, again, I can't emphasize enough just how important it is to see someone like him his experience at his age to have this mindset and he's changed a bit over his career as we know, but also knowing that he's now coming into Mets organization where analytically saber metrics wise and entire front office, this is something larger than he's ever been dealt before. You know, to have him openly say in Baltimore, we would have loved to use more advanced analytics to have a bigger department, but we simply couldn't fund it. So like my hands were tied. We had to work with what was available to us and rightfully so. Us Mets fans know very well not working with much, if at all, uh, analytics department. So for him now to come in a spot where really the world's his oyster, Steve Cohen's going to give him everything 
humanly possible for him to work with. You know, he's kind of acting like a kid in a candy store, and rightfully so. He just he's eager to get to work. I love that about him. I'm sure that you love that about him as well. So, um, really, uh, further on Buck here now that he's going to be with the Mets and his approach. What do you think is going to be the biggest X factor that could either benefit players or maybe not benefit specific players regarding the culture change because as he said in the presser you know he really likes the acquisitions not just for talent wise but character wise how they're going to help this clubhouse but he also made it known that you know subtractions could very well be your best additions and i think we can kind of put two and two together the types of characters that maybe weren't voting well with this clubhouse so what's your take on all that i think it's telling that the mets have not brought back a single free agent that was a free you know that their contract expired after the season you know there's still maybe i guess a chance for a familiar or a brad hand or something after a lockout but i think the mets realized there was a clubhouse issue of some kind you know i think you're seeing different things from different people i don't i wasn't in there so i'm not going to speculate on specific people um but i think it's clear that the clubhouse dynamic did not work that they had and i think there was a it, it was kind of led on that it was a, a much tighter knit group than maybe it was. And, you know, I think Buck's going to bring that adult in the room that they really needed. I think the clubhouse got a little out of control. Obviously, you had the rat and raccoon incident and, you know, some other things transpired throughout the year. I think Buck is going to calm a lot of things in there. And they brought in veteran players like Max Scherzer. Like, if you're not, you're going to listen to Max Scherzer. If he tells you something, you're listening to Max Scherzer. And then Mark Canna and Wardo Escobar and Starling Marte are all renowned as excellent clubhouse guys. So I think they're looking to just remake this culture and kind of the short term core of this team. Because uh, I think you're kind of looking at this really in a short term, short term window as far as like all in. That doesn't mean, you know, when this two, three years expires that they're going to go into a rebuild. I think their plan is go all in right now build up the farm system in the background you know they're gonna have a bunch of draft picks this year with two first round picks compensation picks like they're gonna try to build up that farm system behind these veterans that they brought in so that way it's kind of a seamless transition into the next phase uh, uh, for the mets but yeah i think they just realized what they had didn't work um the core like guys that you and i might like like you know we love dom smith that uh i talked about on my podcast recording today and it was just like if you ask anyone what they think about Dom Smith, sure, everyone in the world is just like, I love Dom Smith. Like, but it's a possibility he's traded after a lockout. Um, JD Davis could be traded, Jeff McNeil could be traded. Like, there's a lot of things that could happen, and they just wanted to change up. Like this core that we all love clearly wasn't it. Like they didn't win, they didn't do anything. We could love the guys, they're great guys, they tried hard, all that good stuff. They didn't win anything. So why would you keep bringing back the same exact equation and then being like, well, this year it's going to be different. Yeah, I think something that was a little bit of a harder pill to swallow, especially when it comes to like my favorite player since really following the Mets every day has been Michael Conforto. So knowing that, you know, he's that that piece that's going to be gone, that that hurts a bit. But I also understand that at the end of the day, if we're just viewing this as, oh, if we run it back with a similar core group, that's the old Mets way. Like that's been the Mets way every year, year in and year out. And I'm hoping for the best Brave Van Wagon and his cheeky smile saying, you know, we're, we're going to be the best team in the division as long as everyone's healthy, right? You know, Buck comes in. He's, you know, no being around the bush, no excuses, you know, cut the BS. We have what we have right now. We're not a playoff team for a reason. This is how we're going to address it. And accountability wise, he made it known today too, you know, that accountability isn't for everyone. And I thought that was a very interesting quote to hear from him. And I want to know what your take is on it because how it resonated with me personally was that, okay, he's going to hope that he can get everyone on the same page. And if it doesn't necessarily resonate well with cer certain players, depending on who they are and their status on the club, that they may end up being their downfall, whether that's say dealt at the trade deadline or something along those lines. So what's kind of your take on just Buck's view on accountability and just being fully aware that you're going to either be in for it or you're not. And we're going to find out sooner than later who exactly those players are. Yeah, I, I really think that's a good way to put it in. It's like he's all in. He expects everyone that puts on that uniform and hat and suits up every day to be all in. You know, that doesn't necessarily mean everyone's going to be treated the exact same way and has to be, you know, he made a point too that I thought was really important is, you know, everyone's different. Like you, 
you have to manage. That's the biggest thing to me about being a manager is you have to manage these different personalities. Uh, you know, you kind of have to talk to Francisco Lindor one way and you could talk to Max Scherzer a different way. You know, there's just differing personalities, but ultimately they have to establish, like you said, a one team goal, which is win. And you need everyone to be all in on winning, put your, you know, sort of selfish goals aside of, I want to hit this average. I want to hit this many home runs. Like everyone's goal should be to win. And I think Buck's going to make sure that's pushed out. And if, like you said, if there's someone that's not all in, they could end up all out at some point. Yeah, no, I, I think I think you said it perfectly too. It's going to be really interesting to see how how he goes about with this clubhouse. It just and you know it's so annoying that we obviously have to deal with this lockout right now. You're fed up with it. I'm fed up. We all are, right? But I will say that even though he can't necessarily have too much connections with these, or at least speak publicly about them, right? Um, one thing that I didn't make a note of already in the stream, and I'm sure you probably agree, is that. If there is a positive buck that maybe people didn't even think about is the fact that he has dealt with lockouts already as a manager in the MLB and knowing that approach of potentially handling, you know, a shortened spring training, for instance. So I think that's just another little tidbit that adds on to all the experience, why it's so important to bring someone like him in outside of just him solely being a manager in the league for 20 years. It's not just that he has experience. It's the kind of experience that he has, you know, context is key with everything. So what's your take on that? He has experience in everything, essentially, right? He has yep. experience in New York City, he has experience in a strike or lockout, whatever you want to call 1994. I'm pretty sure it was technically a strike. I think the players walked. But uh, he has experience in a work stoppage, for lack of a better word. Um, yeah, I think Buck checks all the boxes. And uh, I, have no, I have no reason to have a problem with Buck Showalter today. That doesn't mean in May I won't come on your stream and be complaining when he makes a bad bullpen decision. Oh, we will. It'll, yeah. It's inevitable. That's part, that's part of baseball. Like, we love Buck now. We're going to hate Buck at some point in time. That's that's the gig of being a manager. You are honestly the most unliked person from your fan base because if everything's going well with the baseball club, the manager does not get the credit. The players get the credit. And if everything's going bad, it's the manager and coach's fault. So, uh Buck's prepared for that, though. That's the thing. He's been here in the media, and the media was probably a little more rough in the 90s than they are nowadays. So uh, he he's so prepared for this job, and I think it's going to I think it's going to work out just fine. I think it's too for better or worse. You know how much success or lack thereof he's going to have with the Mets has yet to be seen. But knowing that he is prepared for whatever it's going to take, you know, that's going to be huge for him going forward with the Mets. And that's something that all of us fans can respect, at least, you know, in the highs and the lows, nothing about him is going to be faced, right? You're going to get exactly what you would hope from Buck day in and day out. And hopefully that leads to success. But again, we're going to see what happens on that front. But before I go any further, I just want to shout out everyone that's been watching the live stream at this point. Really appreciate you guys. we got over 300 viewers in here. Again, guys, please make sure at some point to check out Joe DeMeo on Twitter. Check out his articles for SNY regarding, I know you just came out with a prospects ranking recently. Going to want to talk to you about that on a separate occasion because it doesn't feel like it's prospects time for me just yet. I know it is for, it's always prospects time for you, yeah. but for me, I'm not there yet. I'm close getting yeah. there. Um, but actually... With saying that, I do want to mention one thing because a lot of you, I've had people in the chat that have been saying this, um, is regarding Brett Beatty. I just did want to touch on him briefly before we talk about anything else because I know that in your rankings, you did have an expected you know, ETA of 2022. So what's your take on that? Is that something that you believe that we're going to just see a taste of him potentially down the stretch in the season? That's what I would imagine. But yeah, what what was uh, your, um, your um, rationale behind that? Yeah, I mean, it's possible it's just a taste. It's possible it's more. Like, as you know, the Mets used 67 players in 2021. So uh, the we're looking at the ideal lineups, the ideal rotations, and, and all that right now. The reality is you're going to have to deal with the not ideal. And I have the expectation that Brett Beatty is going to start the year in AAA, uh, which makes him a call away. So if he goes and he performs at AAA and – you know, there's an injury at third base that's going to miss some significant time, then I think he's squarely in the conversation to get called up. Uh, I think he's not far from the big leagues. He's a very advanced bat, a great bat the ball skills, great pitch rec recognition skills, uh, consistent high exit velocities, barrel rate. Like he simply knows how to hit. And he made some 
uh, swing adjustments, and I think he puts more loft in the ball. I think you're going to see a lot more of those doubles that he hit turn into home runs because he has the power to all fields. It's just getting the swing right. And to me, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at a above average everyday third baseman, potential for more, uh, exciting prospect that, you know, maybe it's not 2022, but I think there's a very distinct chance. And if it's not, then 2023, he's going to be right there. So he he's coming in short order. Yeah, you know what I think of Brett Beatty, especially what you know, his stance, his ability at the plate, um, ability to spread a field at times too. I do actually see... Uh, a decent level of similarities with him and someone that very well could find himself as a New York Met in 2022, and that's Chris Bryant. Um, you know, I don't know if you've seen that as much. You know, if you look at them side by side, I know Chris is at right, you know, Beatty's at left. But still, just the size, the ability at third, and also his ability to play corner outfield, along with just his swing overall. Now that I'm thinking about it more and more, I actually see quite a bit. So it'll it'll be very interesting to see if KB, of course, does come in the Mets or not on if he will be that placeholder until Beatty's ready before, say, hitting the outfields or something along those lines. But I did want to uh, mention a couple of donations here before we go forward in the live stream. Elliot, thank you so much for the $2 donation. Really appreciate that. Great supporter on the channel. Hi, guys. Joe, do you think this team will win the East? He, he just wants to know right away. Okay, we're not even done with moves. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think the Mets are going to win the East as of now. I don't think they're the favorite right now. I know that a lot of people would love to say the Mets are the favorite, but they still have more moves to be had. I, I think you could probably agree with that one. The It's the Braves division until it's not. That's the way I look at it. Yep. But the Mets have made significant strides in their roster, and I think from a talent versus talent conversation, they've closed the gap to the Braves, I think, a bit, and it's it's probably a lot closer than you know maybe some want to say, but I agree with you. It's it's the Braves division until it's not, and you know maybe this is the year that it's not. But I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pick the Mets. I'm gonna pick the Braves every year until they lose it. Yeah, I'm not I'm not gonna try to give false expectations like I had going into last season. I I, I was feeling very firm, just riding the Steve Cohen wave. Obviously, you know we're gonna win first. You know, and don't get me wrong, we were in first for over a hundred days, and then I, I didn't expect us to not even make playoffs at that point, but. Of course, neither did Steve Cohen. So that's exactly why they're doing the 180 and everything that they're doing right now, right? But Tim, great member and friend on the channel. Thank you so much for the $5 donation. Buck will get us a chip. I have a gut feeling we signed Chris Bryant. We aren't done. Okay, so thank you so much for the donation, Tim. Really appreciate that. So let's get into, before we get into, you know, your kind of ideas of players that you would potentially like to see the Mets land post-lockout, I want to talk of, you know, what's next for the Mets, right, in addressing this coaching staff. As we know, the press today, Billy Epler, I mean, pardon me, Buck Showalter may know that both Buck and Billy are already talking, you know, trying to get this coaching staff together. And are there any names that have popped in your mind right away or that you've seen? Because I've seen a couple from my good friend Pat Ragazzo covers the Mets through Sports Illustrator. Ray came out with a piece on some options. But one name that everyone's been talking about, I've seen you chime in a little bit on it too, is, of course, Carlos Beltran. We're never going to lose out on this name until the season starts, right? So what's your take on Beltran? What do you think the likelihood or unlikelihood of him coming in either as a bench coach or an advisor would be? Um, and I'll share my stance on as, as well, but I want to hear your take. I mean, Mike Puma from the New York Post wrote in an article that, you know, it seems like Steve Cohen likes Beltran and would like to have him a part of the organization, whether that is on the coaching staff or, like you said, as an advisor in the front office. I like to think that there's a better than 50% chance that Carlos Beltran's in some way with the organization next year. And to me, I think the bench coach is a really good spot for him. I'd like, what I want to see the Mets do is, you know, you're going to get a mix of Bucks guys and then Billy's guys on the staff. Like yeah. I think you'll see Butterfield probably or Kirby, like those couple guys that were longtime first and third base coach for Buck. Like those yeah, guys I think Kirby is almost like a lock. I think he's like the most confident guy I have right now. Yeah, I think, you know, Buck will get his guys and then Billy will get some of his. But with the whole analytics and working together thing, I think what would make the most sense on the bench, maybe it's not Beltron, but Beltron obviously fits fits the mold. But my mold is basically I'm looking for a younger, analytically driven mind that can sit next to Buck and be the conduit between the front office and Buck. And that way, when in-game decisions are needed to be made, you know, Buck can manage the way he wants to manage, but he'll have a guy sitting right to his right that says, here's what the numbers say you should do. And yeah. then Buck kind of take that information and do what he, what he will with it. If he hires, you know, another one of an old school baseball guy, which, you know, it's not necessarily a negative, but you might get, not get 
in my opinion, the full advantage of what you can by combining kind of the quote unquote old school and the analytics just sitting next to each other on a bench. I think, I think that hire would make a lot of sense. Beltron or, you know, think of somebody similar, like who's some young analytic dude out there. That's a first base coach or something like that. That would get a, maybe the guy from the Dodgers at the end. I was going to say that. Yeah. Dodgers first base coach that we interviewed. Yeah. That's the first guy that comes to my mind. Love to ask him if, you know, he'd be willing for that. But yeah, to me, I think that's, that's how I envision a coaching staff, just a mix of Bucks guys and Billy's guys. And then everyone work together. Yeah. And I, I've been saying this literally forever, you know, as someone that going into the managerial search, I was not in love with the idea of Buck. You know, I was very pro Joe Espada, Contrero as well. And, you know, Buck was someone that, you know, I did say at the end of the day before I became more knowledgeable on him because I absolutely love the guy now. But prior to that, I was like, regardless of what the Mets are doing at the end of the day, I'm supporting because they, they've done nothing to prove me uh, wrong so far this offseason with how they've won about everything, right? So I'm going to support fully with what they, what they believe is best for this team. And showing that they have Buck, you know, I've always thought, okay, if they're going to have Buck, great. That's your short-term outlook. Let's have someone on the bench as your long-term outlook. That's what I felt was most appealing with Joe Espada or Matt Cotrero, just knowing that those are guys that could be here potentially for a long time and really build something special. But at the same time, when you think about a Carlos Beltran, again, my biggest gripe with him going back to when he was originally hired by the Mets was the fact that he had no coaching experience. So it's not like, you know, he had minor league coaching experience and nothing. And as great of a player as he is, it's the same notion with people that want David Wright in here. It's the same people that want Curtis Granderson and everyone. Like, we all love these Mets legends, but just because they were great Mets does not mean that's going to transition coaching-wise at all. And it very well could be a detriment to what their legacy currently is with the club. So it could really end up not looking as pretty as what you would hope it would be, right? So Beltron, I think, gives you that balance, of course, of having that Buck as your short term, a guy to really build off of and get to know the ins and out on just being a manager in the MLB and really taking that next step once his contract is up in three years or whenever he would be done with the New York Mets. So I love that idea. I love the idea of potentially going after the Dodgers for a space coach because the Mets do have that familiarity with them. Maybe they are, maybe they even interviewed him for the managerial position in part knowing him as a backup plan because you're not really going to get that with Cotrero. You're not going to get that with a spot on more than likely because these are guys that the likelihood of them doing a lateral move from a successful club that currently on, it feels pretty slim in my mind, you know? Yeah. So it going out, yeah, exactly. exactly. It, so I think if you can get someone that can be your long-term fit behind Buck, that's the best of both worlds. Same way on how you can look at even Joe Espada with Dusty Baker right now. And while I don't think that Joe has that position on lock, because if he did, I don't see why he would be going after every managerial position available the past couple of years, right? So there's something there that we don't know about, but he's a great example of someone that's been intertwined and really helping decision-making for Dusty the past year or two since he's came in as manager for the Astros. And, you know, even, even guys, even though I know A.J. Hinch is younger, but Alex Cora obviously had a huge impact with A.J. Hinch during their time in Houston. So just using them as examples because it holds true. I would love that for the Mets. I think that's the best route for them to go down, but... Getting on to other positions as well, I'm talking about, you know, just a couple in particular, you know, Butterfield makes plenty of sense to me. And, you know, someone that, as I said, makes, feels like almost too much sense is Wayne Kirby, because if you guys don't know, Wayne Kirby was first base coach throughout Buck's entire tenure uh, with the Baltimore Orioles. He was with the San Diego Padres from 2020 until now this offseason. He did try to get the job with the LA Angels, but they said no to him. So he became available. And it was noted, I think, from John Heyman or Ken Rosenthal back on around December 8th that, you know, he could find himself landing back with the Mets now that that's available. And I also saw that family member of Kirby's, I don't know if it's his daughter or, you know, someone in his family heavily advocating for it, like excited about it, especially when Buck got hired. So I think that Kirby, Wayne Kirby is almost inevitable to come as like first base coach or some part of this coaching staff. Um, he's 57 years of age. Um, another one, when you're talking about Brian Butterfield, third base coach, infield option for the Mets, um, you know, because he's had connections uh, with Buck's time uh, with the Yankees and also in Arizona. Um, so he's had connections with Buck for a bit. And there's some other names out there that Pat Ragazzo has thrown out there and Jim Presley for a hitting coach potentially. You know, that one doesn't feel likely to me. John Russell, bench coach option, um, you know, and then, of course, Beltron. So we're, it'll be interesting to see what route they go down, but I'm with you. I think if there's one way to ease Beltron in back into the Mets organization as a coach, 
this is the best way to possibly do it. I think it's the best of both worlds for both sides, as long as he's willing and that the Mets are willing to, of course, rekindle that relationship. But I did want to address a donation here in the live stream before we go a little bit further. Buzz, thank you so much for the $2 donation. Who do I like for a hitting coach? I don't really have a certain preference for a hitting coach. To be honest, you know, I'm not a an expert. As soon as I see more reports coming out, I'm going to do my due diligence. I've already started just looking at, you know, his uh, buck staff throughout his entire career with the Orioles, with, you know, the Yankees, Diamondbacks, and even Rangers. And where are they now? I think that's where everyone's drawing these names from, right? But there's no one really in particular. If there's one name that actually would have been appealing, he just signed as an assistant hand coach today with the Yankees, that being an Eric Chavez. Chavez was a name that was rumored to be a potentially a managerial candidate for the New York Mets. It didn't happen. He did have connections with Billy Epler, of course, with the Yankees, with the Angels too, and had a very, very short stint uh, managing the uh, AAA club for the Angels during Epler's time as GM. So they've had a good connection, but he goes to the Yankees. Um, I mean, are there any names hitting coach-wise that you're enticed by, or are you just like, I'm up for whatever they're going to throw at me? I have absolutely no clue. Man. <laughs> I don't know any free agent hitting coaches or who's assistant hitting coach somewhere that would get a promotion to be a full-time hitting coach. Uh, I just, whoever it is, I hope they – they just are in line with what the organizational philosophy is heading towards. Um, clearly, I think you just have to look at the acquisitions. They're looking for more contact. They're looking for on-base skills. At least two out of three are on-base skills. Escobar, not so much. But these are guys that don't strike out. These are guys that make contact. So you want to match up your hitting coach with kind of what you're doing personnel-wise. You don't want your hitting coach to say this and your hitters to think this those things just don't work out. So hopefully whoever they have their eye on has a similar approach to what it certainly appears the Mets are preferring in the creation additions. And I think 2021 was a prime example of just not having a, everyone on the same page, you know, from Chile in the beginning and Zach Scott and then Chile's comments about Zach after the season were quite telling of certain things on where he stands. Um, and then of course with I, I, Quattlebaum and um, forgetting the other gentleman's name who's with Quattlebaum for the heading coach. Yeah. Kevin Howard. Yeah. So yes. now they're both running player development, which is what they were hired to do. They were hired, exactly. they were hired, hired to be the heads of player development down in the minor leagues. Then they got promoted when Chile was let go. And now they're just back doing the jobs they were hired for. And and I think that's going to work out fine. And there was a reasons why we had absolutely no clue who those guys were to begin with. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm still excited no less to see how the, uh, the coaching staff is going to fill out. Hopefully, I don't. I don't know exactly how long it's going to take. They're not really in a rush, of course. Um, I mean, the only exception maybe would be with the Oakland A's, depending on who they're bringing back or keeping. But I don't really think that they're in a position like the Mets right now. You know, they have Jeremy Hefner, and then that's it. And Buck spoke glowingly of Jeremy Hefner, which was great to see too. Say, you know, I can't wait to get back on the phone with him. So Hefner clearly looks like that one guy that the Mets were proper and right from the beginning to keep. I think he's going to do great things for them. But, you know, to wrap up the coaching discussions now, let's get into the fun stuff, even though there is no hot stove, but there's still reasons to be excited about once the lockout is lifted. The Mets are obviously not done. They still have plenty more to address going for another big time star, potentially maybe even a depth star is still, and also potentially addressing things with one more significant bat. Um, so what are, what's your takes right now at this point in time? What are some players that you personally would like to see the Mets land, or maybe what are some players that you think are actually far, far more realistic than maybe some people believe that the Mets would land? So on the pitching side, I, I'm i not into any of the free agents. Like Carlos Rodon doesn't do it for me. Like I appreciate his highs, but that, guy cannot stay on the mound and yeah you're too concerned about his inconsistencies health wise and yeah and the reality is you have max scherzer 37 years old yeah like they're not there's gonna be health questions like you have to at least ask the question he's throwing a million innings throughout his career he's 37 you have to at least ask the question will he miss some time jacob de grom has to prove that everything that transpired in 2021 is a fluke uh, Cookie Carrasco had a, a varying thing did the hamstring, the elbow. Uh, he had different things going on throughout the year and then got surgery at the end of the year. He's going to be fine for spring training, but uh, you're not 100% sure on his health. He's up or up there in age. He's 34, 30, turning 35, something like that. Uh, Taiwan Walker's been hurt for his whole career, basically, except for his first year at the Mets. So you have to wonder could he get injured in 2022? So at that point, do you want to have five starters that you're not confident are going to take the ball every fifth day? No. So I'm looking for someone that I think is maybe a little more reliable, um, even if 
you know, obviously you could think on the high level, Luis Castillo uh, from Cincinnati. That would be obviously super exciting if they could get someone like him. Not so sure Cincinnati's looking to trade him. Uh, but if you look at a guy like Sonny Gray, he's been very reliable. I like him. Uh, Tyler May- Molly, Maley, I don't, I don't actually Maybe, know. Yeah, potato, potato, one of those two. Yeah, that guy, that guy in Cincinnati, he's been yeah. he's <laughs> underrated, really good. Uh, and then you have the Oakland starters, obviously Chris Bassett, Frankie Montas, Sean Manaya. Like, I think the trade market is where you should go for starters because Rodon doesn't do it. I'm not like you say Kikuchi's fine, but to me, he's like a four or five guy. And you know, yeah, he is a four or five guy. You're right. He's not a middle of the rotation guy. And if they want a four or five guy, that's fine. Like, I, I don't think they need to get another premium starter, but if you can, you should certainly try. Um, on the offensive side of the ball, I wouldn't mind adding another bat, but I don't need Chris Bryant. And frankly, if Chris Bryant's going to run you that six, seven year deal, I'm not doing that. I just don't. I don't think the Mets are. I don't. I think. I think for similar reasons why the Mets wouldn't do it with Baez is the same yeah. reason why they wouldn't go six with Bryant. Yeah. I think if you if you can get Bryant to agree to a shorter term, high AAV, maybe even throw an opt out his way. Then maybe he'll, you know, you can play there. Uh, but, you know, I'm looking for just one more bat. It doesn't even need to be someone of huge impact. Uh, like, I'd like a Nelson Cruz, like a DH. You know, if a I DH, think you're really going to like tomorrow's video. <laughs> if a DH is coming, sign Nelson Cruz. He just straight up rakes. He's going to rake until he doesn't feel like raking anymore. Like, he's, he's the man. Uh, I think they could use more depth. I think that's going to be the biggest thing that you can learn from 2021 is depth, 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 depth. So, you know, find this year's Jonathan VR, this year's Kevin Pillar. Um, you want, you know, you want one more starter for sure in the rotation. And then you need guys that you could bring in that have minor league options left that you could send to AAA Syracuse because you have to be eight, nine, 10 deep with guys that you are okay pitching in a major league game uh, to get through a season. So they need to bolster depth for sure. And then in the bullpen, you want to replace Aaron Loop with a lefty. Uh, someone like an Andrew Chafin obviously makes sense in free agency. Um, and a guy, Chris Christopher Soto, I'm not sure if you know who he is on Twitter, but he and I talk a, a lot about different things. Um, the Diamondbacks are a team that's supposedly looking for a controllable third baseman. Um, J.D. Davis seem, seemingly fitting the mold of someone that could potentially interest them. Whatever, what what is their description of an actual third baseman? That I think well, that's someone that stands there with a glove is my understanding. Okay, okay, <laughs> I think we're on the right path then. Yeah, I mean, maybe they don't, maybe they don't know the JD defense as much as we do. But um, you know, maybe a JD Davis to Arizona for someone like Caleb Smith and and something like maybe that's the kind of deal that makes sense. You don't nec- like I don't think JD Davis is headlining a deal that brings you Sean Manaya. I, th- I think he's part of a deal that gets you like yeah. a Shamanaya. Yeah, exactly. He mm-hmm. could, or conversely, you can go ahead and trade him and fill a different role, uh, like maybe a lefty reliever. And Caleb Smith is a guy that pitches really well against lefties historically. Um, he started, he's also pitched out of the pen, so he has that flexibility to give you multiple innings. And I think you know Billy Epler has really honed in on that since he took the job, that it's all about finding a way to get through the innings. And – one day you could throw in one inning. The next day you could go three. You just need to have that flexibility. And I think Caleb Smith's a guy that intrigues me a little bit as kind of that lower end move that maybe has some upside. And yeah, I think that's really kind of how I look at it. I'd like one more bat if they could, one more starter, and then depth, 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 and more depth. So uh, I'm going to go uh, starting with bullpen and then work my way back to the top of this uh, player discussion. You know, you're right. I think what we've seen too with uh, Epler and Buck and everyone is that they're going to want guys that have that versatility that give you an, an amazing amount of depth, but also especially bullpen where they can be that stretch starter for you if need be. And if you're looking for a top tier guy, I think someone that really sticks out like a sore thumb on the free agent market is a former New York Met and Colin McHugh. You know, especially a guy that's transitioned because, as we know, used to be a starter, has been a reliever the past couple of years, and especially look at what he did 1.55 year ready. You can't get, literally baseball savant numbers are just you would have never thought that this would be Colin McHugh. Other than is him being like the four percentile on fastball velocity. That's how you know it's him. But yeah, yeah I mean, I think if you're looking 
through the free agent market, which is exactly what the Mets are doing to address this team without giving up the farm, right? That's how you build. That's how the Yankees have built. That's how the Dodgers have built. Everyone to really improve on their farm with still having success. McHugh feels like that top guy through the market. Um, Caleb Smith is a very interesting name, too, if you're looking, you know, trade route as well. Um, other bullpen names, of course, too. I mean, emphasis on Southpaw. Andrew Chafin is, I think, the best Aaron Loop replacement. If they have interest there, I would assume that they will. To what what degree, I don't know. I I was heavily advocating for Chafin that they trade for him at the past trade deadline. They didn't. He still did really well with Oakland. Um, you know, plenty of other names, the Ryan Taperas, um, the even Jake Diekmans, who I think that uh, Jeremy Hefner could bode well with as a veteran Southpaw from Oakland. Um, or even trade route, if there's one name, I, I know that he might cost you a little bit more than what you would hope for from a reliever, but someone that's arbitration eligible with a small market team that doesn't want to pay for it. Taylor Rogers, that Mike Puma reported uh, that the Mets have some level of interest in when they lost on loop. So um, out of those names in particular, what, what stands out the most to you? Oh, Rogers. I mean, that's a guy that's a capable closer. And obviously Edwin Diaz is probably going to be the closer on opening day or whatever, if they even have like a pure closer. These viewers don't know that you are probably the biggest Edwin Diaz fan out there. So yeah. I'm curious how that's going to resonate with everybody, but go yeah. on. People hate Edwin Diaz. It is what it is. I, I've given I don't, up I don't, I don't hate Diaz. I, I'm more of a, I'm more of an optimist than anything else. Yeah. I've given up the fight, but uh, you got Diaz, you got Seth Lugo, hopefully bouncing back to his prior self after, you know, coming back from the elbow surgery. So hopefully in 2022, you're seeing the Seth Lugo that, has dominated as a reliever rather than the Seth Lugo this year. That was kind of a, a roller coaster up and down. Uh, Trevor May, I think, pitched really well for the Mets for the most part. He had, you know, his couple outings where he got bombed. And that's unfortunately what people will remember about relievers. You can go ahead and go scoreless for 10 outings and then you give up a home run in the 11th. And all they care about is that you give a home run in the 11th. One. Yep. Uh, so if you add another guy like Rogers, then you're adding, you know, four guys that are capable to pitch at the end of a baseball game. And that gives Buck and this coaching staff the flexibility on a given day to play matchups. Like I don't need, you know, I love Edwin Diaz, but he doesn't need to pitch the ninth inning every day for me. Like if the matchups say he should pitch in the seventh one day, pitch him in the seventh. Like let's just get his mentality okay yeah. with pitching in the seventh yeah. that's that's the biggest hurdle i don't know why he's so jekyll and hide when yeah. it comes to being he's in closing situation hide, period man that's kind of i think that's part of what i love about him like he's he's a wild thing but you, like <laughs> yeah you have no clue what to expect but his stuff's unreal like when he's on there is there is not a better reliever in baseball like when he's on he's as dominant as anybody i can uh, agree with that the unfortunate reality is you sometimes know on the first pitch when he throws a fastball to the backstop all right, it's going to be one of those days. We're going to have to get through these three outs a little creatively. But uh, no, just give yourself more options at the end of games. I think if you're able to do that, that's just advantageous to the team. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Mets fans, you know, are a lot of them are fed up with Diaz, not just because of his introductory season and that trade to begin with, but also because we in recent years, you know, throughout the 2010s, we've seen so much ups and downs with the closer. Jerry's familiar before him. Familiar was so dominant. You know, his early years, especially the World Series run and everything. And but still, then once things got towards him being traded Oakland, there was more inconsistencies. Other relievers like Hanzo Robles, of course, point up to the sky. So they're just I feel like Mets have Mets fans. We've all just been so used to that inconsistency at the pitch uh, at the closing position that just the thought of someone that is just a sure lock night in and night out. It just has us all salivating by the mouth. And I, I don't blame anyone for feeling that way. I don't either. But. Tell me who that guy is. There's like one of them in baseball. So like you're getting Josh Hader. If you're getting Josh Hader, okay. But outside of Josh Hader, there's not another closer. Like go like Liam Hendricks with the White Sox had a great year. He and Edwin Diaz blew the same amount of saves last year. Like the reality the is the media won't tell you that though. Right. Yeah, exactly. So the reality is Edwin's frustrating. If you were a fan of 29 other teams in base or 28 because i'll say the brewers are, are in a good spot because josh Hader just is locked down basically every single time he touches the baseball but outside of him i'm sure every other fan base goes through similar stuff that the mets fans are going through with edwin diaz edwin's one of the better relievers in baseball <laughs> um and that's you know the stats outside of his first year here basically back that up he's really good but just inconsistent and that's that goes with relievers kind of to your 
uh, your point about like, you know, loop and guys like that. That's like, you don't know what you're getting from year to year. Like Aaron loop had this great year in 2021, in 2022. Who's to say Aaron loop doesn't go back to being a good, really good, not great reliever. It, you don't know. So uh, it's a year to year game. Exactly. And I think that was a huge factor to him not returning and the Mets being like, okay with it. You know, um, I don't, I loop had multiple years with the Mets where he was just sh- shutting the door. And I think it's a different discussion, but you know, especially a guy that thrived, of course, a short uh, 2020 season with the Tampa Bay Rays and knowing how well they always do with pitching then coming to the Mets. And I, I think Aaron loop is a prime example. And I'll, I'll say this plenty of, not just, you know, his personal success, because I don't want to take anything away from him. He was amazing to have a sub one year Ray for over 60 appearances, something that should not be slighted. But I think it also tells you a bit about the Mets approach with this bullpen that for a large majority of the season, especially was utilized well. And you could tell that the difference in that analytics department was definitely boating well with certain guys. I think Loop was one of those beneficiaries, especially coming from a Tampa Bay Rays organization where he understands the game maybe a little bit more advanced than some of the other guys that we got in the pen right now. So I, I think that we're going to see year in and year out the Mets, they are going to have some names in the pen that maybe you didn't think the best of originally. It's not for penny pinching, but it's just for rather really gain the best utilization out of your team. And maybe you do find something that other people aren't realizing. You know, players have to start somewhere at the end of the day, right? Maybe even if they're late bloomers. I think we're going to see more and more of that with the Mets, not just 2022, but in the years going forward and just how well they are at player development and getting them up to the times and really finding hidden gems and finding more about them than what, you know, you would originally expect from a Mets organization, say, a decade ago. It would have been vastly different. That's what you're paying, Billy Epler. That's what you're paying these you know, potentially 30 analytical analytical people in the department. Like that's what you're paying them to find, to find, all right, Aaron Loop came here for a year and $3 million or three and a half, whatever it was. Fantastic move. He was great. He went and got paid elsewhere. I need to find the next Aaron Loop for a year and $3 million. That's what you pay those guys for. The reality is fans want all the stars. They want all big money deals, everything. I totally understand that. But the reality is, if that's if the Mets GM job is just spend Steve Cohen's money, you or I could do the job. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need to hire Billy Epler and all these people to just spend the money. Like they're going to spend the money. They clearly did. They're going to have the highest payroll in baseball. I've been saying it for months and months. And when the lockout ends, the Mets are still going to have the highest payroll in baseball because they're going to add more pieces. Um, but the reality is that's why you hire these people to find the gems, the diamonds in the rough, the people that, you know, we might look at the day they sign and go, eh, like I did that with Jonathan VR. I did that with Loop. Like they signed, I was like, eh, it's fine. Depth. Oh, Aaron Loop's a lefty. I would have preferred Justin Wilson, but I would have you know, preferred Aaron, right hand, you know, like <laughs> yeah, Justin exactly. got hurt and struggled and Aaron Loop was awesome. So you never know where, where it's going to go, but you have to, you have to trust your people. And, you know, that's, that's another part of Steve Cohen's investments into the team. You know, he's investing in the major league payroll. He's investing in the player development. He's investing in the analytics. Make use of all these people. Yeah, no, 100%. I couldn't have said it better. Um, regarding position players, quick, I know that you're not as, like, I'm someone that's been so, you know, enamored with the idea of Chris Bryant because it feels like he's been a New York Met at this point, right, with the amount of times we've talked about in this past year. It, it still feels inevitable to me. And I think Billy Epler coming out and saying that, we don't just want guys that are versatile, but he loves the idea of players that can play both in the infield and the outfield. And also someone that could address third base until Beatty's up and then potentially be in the corner. I'm like, he checks off all those boxes, but I do think that the biggest reason as to why he may very well not come to the Mets is because of going past, say, a five-year deal. Maybe even five years too much that the Mets are comfortable doing. Like, we don't know that right now. They have the money to spend, but just because they have the money doesn't mean that that's necessarily the route they want to go down, and that might be a detriment to their future. So we're all aware of that. But KB, I still think that he checks off the boxes so much of what has been publicly said and what we know to this point on what the Mets holes still are with this roster. And to add that depth, to add that winning caliber, and to add that guy that can still get on base plenty, you know, he has all those qualities for sure. And that's why I find him so appealing. And also being a Scott Boris client. Now I can look at Scott Boris client and say, hey, maybe we shouldn't shy away from that, them as much, right? Especially after Scherzer. I know that Scott is going to speak nothing but glowingly to Chris about the Mets now with how everything has transpired. So I view him as still a very realistic option. 
especially in the scenario if that prohibits him from going to a rival like the Phillies, maybe even the Braves if they become a sleeper and get involved there. So, I mean, landing Starling Marte wasn't just pivotal because of the immediate impact he has, but also because you take him directly away from a rival because it seemed like the Phillies, in my mind, I thought Marte was going to go to Philly. So for the Mets to land him, that was huge, and that, that's aspects that you have to weigh when you're in a win-now stage. I think it's different if the Mets are in a spot where, you know, we're trying to compete, we're going to see what happens, that type of thing. But no, no, that they have a full mentality that they're all in starting next year. And if you're trying to go all in, you have to make sure that you're obviously going to put out better performance, better players out on the field than your opposing clubs within your division. So I view that as a factor. I mean, there's plenty of players that I would like to see the Mets acquire all on the Nelson Cruz train. Like I said, I'll be talk talking about briefly. De totally did not do all the editing and everything that I need to do today for tomorrow's video. So yeah, I'm excited to talk about him for sure. I think he would be a great pickup for the Mets. Um, that'll be expanding on more. Uh, but going pitching wise, I agree with you on the trade market too. A shaman, I, I think makes probably the most sense just because of his value arbitration year. A's don't want to pay that they're selling. He'll then become a free agent in the next year or so Mets can extend him big, big towering lefty and middle year rotation that has more consistency than Carlos Rodon. And I would, I wouldn't shy away from Rodon. If you can get him on a shorter term, high, higher AAV deal, not against it, but you do have your risks. Of course, you know, it's going to be high risk, high reward. Let's see if, if that risk is going to be worth it in the end. That's so a question mark. And I don't know if that's exactly what the Mets want to do. I know that they'll consider it. I don't know if that's going to be their priority. However, Mania feels like the safer bet. Sonny Gray, I've talked about plenty. Gray has a lot of similarities to Marcus Stroman in my mind. And I think that not just because of size, but just because of especially being a ground ball pitcher at times too. But a lot of people have not been in favor of Sonny Gray because of his, his Yankee stint. I preached it last offseason when the Mets had a level of interest in him. If you looked at his stint with the Yankees, he really was adamant about saying on how his utilization was wrong. You know, cutting down on his sliders was something that didn't bode well for him from reports that I've seen. So I don't think that would be the same situation in the Bronx and it would be with the Mets again. Uh, but I, I know that a lot of people are going to be hesitant with Sonny saying that, oh, we can't handle the big market. Okay, if you're going to stand by that. That's fine. I'm not trying to sway you otherwise right now. But, you know, Castillo would be great. I don't think it's likely. I think he's just going to cost an arm and a leg. You know, the Mets wouldn't do it for Jose Barrios at the trade deadline. Similar profile. Uh, I don't necessarily see Castillo coming to fruition. Would love it. Of course, I would be all down for a guy with his control and everything. But I, I think, again, Oakland A's, Ashamaniah, Chris Bassett, who doesn't have necessarily as much length as a starter because he was a reliever for a bit. But definitely a guy in recent years has proven his worth and could be a beyond sneaky pickup. Someone that is not going to cost you the entire farm at all that the Mets could part with some guys that don't necessarily have a position on the team, like the J.D. Davises, like the Dominic Smiths, et cetera. So I think we're all in agreement there. But, yeah, I think we really touched on everything. I, as long as it's fine with you, I'd say let's just answer a handful of questions before we get out of here. How's that sound? Yeah, let's do it, man. Okay, awesome. And again, shout out everybody in the live stream. We've had consistently over 300 viewers. Thank you guys so much. Help us get 13K subs. Help us get 300 likes by the end of the stream. Always appreciate it. Please make sure to check out Joe DeMeo with everything in the description down below. If you have, if you don't know who Joe DeMeo is, I don't know what you're doing. Please make sure to check him out. He's doing great stuff for the Mets, for his podcast, either that's the Mets podcast with Connor Rogers and everything else prospects wise, doing a fantastic job. Um, but okay, a couple of questions. Is Castillo lefty? No, he is not. Um, okay, let me oh, let me make sure people know we're in a QA. and a um, Hold on one second. Um, While we're here, make sure you check out the That's So Mets YouTube channel. We're trying to build up that too. Yes, yes. Yeah, we're doing weekly streams there. Um, so yeah, search That's So Mets on YouTube. You know, you're all here. We are trying to get to a thousand subscribers. We're at seven something last I looked, 700 and something. So we're trying to hit 1K. I know we're not quite on Wardy's level, but uh, yeah. You have to start somewhere. Yeah. I was at, you know. Somewhere. Yeah. We're working towards it. So check out, uh, and we're got, I was talking to Connor earlier. We were recording this week's podcast. And I told him I was doing this and he said, we're gonna have to have you on our, on our stream. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, it would be a pleasure. I got to get Connor on here too. The only reason why I didn't do it tonight is because I have specific topic for you both in store. I haven't even told you guys about it yet. I got everything hey. in my notes lined up, so right. we'll talk soon off air about it, but yeah, yeah. I would love to do that. Um, Especially, I know that uh, my my good friend Richie that's been on the channel a lot too. He's interacted with Connor before too, so maybe we can get a two and two going. I think that'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, okay, let's answer some questions, right? So um, let's see. We are reading the live chat. Yes, I want to see any questions you guys got. Um, 
Is Cano, will he be on the team next year? That's a good question. I have a feeling he's actually not going to be. I think the Mets are going to either somehow, some way, be able to deal that contract or they're going to bury it. I, I just don't think Steve Cohen wants Robinson Cano on this roster. Again, I could be proven wrong. It, it's not easy to part with that contract, so he could have some impact. But I, at this point, I will be a little surprised if Robinson Cano has any level of impact for the Mets in 2022. What's your take? The problem is he has no trade clause, so you can't just, even if someone wants the money, he has to want to go to that place. That's fair. Setting him. Uh, I think Robinson Cano will be on the team. Uh, okay. I don't know what the role is going to be. He might do some DH stuff. He might be coming off the bench. Uh, I think the reality is he is a veteran that as much as we don't like him and uh, you know the rest of the fan base and everything and people are down on him, there's people in the organization, like Billy Epler has a long relationship with Robinson Cano. Um, Francisco Lindor looks up the Robinson Cano. Starling Marte has a very close relationship uh, with Cano. So I think Cano will be on the team, to be honest. Um, you're stuck with the contract. You might as well, at minimum, bring him to to St. Lucie and see what he's got. And, you know, I guess if he technically, if he physically is not as good as people you could put on the bench instead, then you have to eat the contract and cut him. But my expectation is he'll be on the opening day roster. Okay. I, I think, again, I think that could be the more realistic route just because how much of a con how much of a hassle his contract is to part with to begin with. So it, we'll see. I, I, you know, at the end of the day, if he is on the Mets in any form, I just hope that, you know, he can benefit, but we all know that he's limited. How much can he provide in the field? Is he more of just really a DH? Is that his spot? And really as a transition for a DH, Let's answer this question from Adele, Mets star fan. How long will the lockout last? Neither of us know. I mean, I, I hope it ends soon, but I'd imagine it's probably going to go into either mid to late February, if I'm just assuming. Um, and also, do Mets fans want DH? I've seen a big divide on this. I am so far on the DH train, especially after the Shore in 2020 season, that there's nothing that I actually want more than Mets DH. As much as I love Jacob deGrom uh, being the best hitter on the Mets, i much rather him not take those chances of injuries, which he was hurt multiple times from his swing earlier this season in 2021. And I think a DH just opens the floodgates, gives you more offensive power, more offensive possibility, and gives you possibility with some younger guys too, um, like a Mark Vientos, for instance, potentially. So what's your take on all that? Yeah, lockout, I think check back February 1st. And from there, I think that's when you'll start seeing progress in the month of February. So he got a little bit still, unfortunately, but we're getting to January here in a couple days, so we'll, we'll get there. Um, as far as the DH, I don't know how, how anyone could not want the DH. Like, there's no value to pitchers. If pitchers cared about what they were doing at the plate, my, my thought might be a little different. Pitchers don't care to bunt anymore. They certainly don't care to hit. Like, get it out of here. No one cares about it anymore. No one wants to do it. Like, I know that uh, Marcus Stroman and Taiwan Walk were outspoken. They're like, I never want to hit again. So uh, forget forget about pitchers hitting. It's valueless. There's nothing to it. it. All it just means is you have to take out the pitcher earlier than you want to because he doesn't want to hit. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you on that one completely. Uh, comment from Andrew. Would you take Donaldson's contract to bring Rodgers' value down and JD still has value at third? Um, okay, so I don't necessarily know how much uh, Josh Donaldson's contract would bring Taylor Rodgers' value down. I do think that might impact it at least slightly. A lot. Um, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. so, Donaldson's got what two or three years left. Yes, Matt's two more money. years. And yeah. I mean, if that if that would be potentially an extra, I mean, I'm all for that because Billy Epler said to begin with that he is open and the Mets are willing to take on say contracts that aren't necessarily the most favorable to either get young prospects to help build this far more because they can simply they can afford it, right? Or in this case, bring in a talent like Taylor Rock. So yeah, I'm all on board with that. I'm sure that's actually something I'll be discussing further on the show because I've been wanting to talk about Donaldson and other third base options. Josh, you know, he's we all know the personality he brings. He's you know he has that snarl to his game. I think he would actually be really really solid as a short term fit. Reminds me a bit of say like a Justin Turner still with the Dodgers right now. Or even pretend like Donaldson, let's think about what he did in his one year with the Braves. Oh my goodness, great. He was the biggest Mets killer known to man. I think he still has it. I think the glove would be competent enough at third for the Mets, or even potentially if they utilized him at DH at times. But if you look at his baseball savant, he still has crazy power 
And yeah, I think I think he could definitely bat for the Mets. And if that can get you Rodgers for the pen, sign me up. I'm really not complaining. For me, if I'm taking a contract like Donaldson, I'm looking more to add to my prospect pool, to be totally honest. Like to okay. me, it's, uh, I'm not saying, you know, oh man, I will take two years and $50 million or whatever it is that Donaldson owed. I'm sure it's something like that. Like I'm not taking two years and $50 million for this guy to get, you know, a reliever. Like I... I like Rogers. I certainly said a few minutes ago, like go get him. Uh, but to me, that wouldn't be worth taking Donaldson's contract. I'd be looking for one of their upper echelon prospects. To be honest, to take that. It really, it really does sound like that you're you don't have much value with Josh Donaldson's impact no. based on his contract. I don't think he's much of a fielder anymore. I think you'd really be piecemealing him to put him at third base, and he's more of a he's more of a DH at this point in time. Okay, I can agree with that. And I mean, if that's available for the Mets. And that way you would still have either Escobar at third, McNeil at second, as long as McNeil isn't traded, that could work. So I, I can understand that a bit with his lack of fielding at this point. Um, so, okay. Uh, let's see. I'll answer a couple more here uh, before we wrap things up, folks. Uh, what I, do I, what do I think? Donation, I say. Got to hit oh, whatever that one is. You got oh my good. Thing. We'll get to that in a second. My goodness yeah. gracious. You got oh, wow. Me. Thank you, guys. I didn't. I don't. I haven't even read it yet. How my yeah. software is. I just see the number, but I don't see the oh, message yeah. or anything. So yeah. I'll get to it shortly. Thank you so much, though. That's crazy. Um, Bombo, though. What do you think the Mets' chances are in getting Suzuki? Nope. Nope. I think they're yeah. done. Yeah. yeah. They're not. They're not going to sign another starting outfielder. Um, Brandon Nimmo, Starling Marte, Mark Canna. There's your outfield. Yep. I agree. A lot of people thought that Mark Hanna would be more of a uh, bench guy for the Met. No, Mark Hanna had over 600 at bats in 2021. And he's gonna he's gonna be all over the place. And you so. don't sign a guy for over 13 million dollars a year to just be like, hey, you're our fourth outfielder. So yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. So yeah no. him to start and Mark Hanna, I love. He's a right to me. He's a right-handed Nemo. He exactly. Is. And I feel like the same people that aren't advocating for Canna are the same people that still believe Brandon Nemo is a fourth outfielder. I mean. Like yeah. It's, yeah, it. everyone's entitled to their opinion. That's fine. I just, I sure. wholeheartedly disagree. Yeah. Um, I wanted Suzuki at the beginning of the off season, but so with, the, with the moves done, just doesn't, doesn't fit. He'll, he'll go to the Red Sox or the Yankees or something like that. And yeah, play. I think, I think he'll go with the Red Sox. I know we follow them on Instagram, unfollow them. I think just for the sake of acting like his market's still open. I don't know how much that'll change, but I think especially after they lost Renfro, it just feels like, you no, know, Jackie Bradley Jr. Should not be starting in the outfield every day for you. So I think, you know, he makes a lot, a lot of sense there. But my goodness gracious, $100 donation for Bremen, who's actually been a great support on the channel since like day one. I haven't seen you in a while. Thank you so much for the donation. That's crazy. Really, really. Pre Guys, hype in the chat for Brennan. He's been a huge supporter. I'd be beyond grateful. Thank you so much for that. It really does mean a lot. Hey, Wardy and Joe, it's been six plus months since listening live. Awesome to see more than 12K subs. What would it take for a combination of Gray Castillo? Oh, wow. Major League Ray pitching Don Mauricio too much would it even be worth it ace pitching better route to go well brendan again thank you so much for the donation cannot begin to tell you how much that means to me and how much that supports the channel so i hope you're doing well my friend thank you so much for chiming in seriously that means a lot but to answer your question i don't think gray and castillo is even a possibility um just because of how much that's going to cost you i think castillo as a whole is going to cost you too much so uh, as we talked about earlier it seems like the oakland a's route is far more the likelier scenario with a shamanaya and or Chris Bass. I think Frankie Montas might be a little too costly given his contract status. Um, so what's your take on that, Joe? Yeah, I agree with you. And I, I think the reality is that the Mets are contractually obligated to Taiwan Walker and Carlos Carrasco. So there's not room for two more bona fide starters unless they're going to go to a six-man rotation, which not a fan of. I don't want to do that. I want more Jacob DeGrom and Max Scherzer pitching, not less. Uh, so unless they were going to a six man, going and getting two bona fide starters to me just doesn't fit. Um, Taiwan, Carrasco, those guys are gonna be part of the rotation whether you like it or not. So um, one of Gray or Castillo makes sense, or like you said, obviously one of the Oakland guys makes sense. But no, that was awesome to see that donation for you. So really, cool. yeah, I mean, I, it was awesome to see him because I've interacted with him like over Zoom calls, like when I first started the channel too. So. Brennan has been a big support on the channel for a while. So that was beyond generous of him. Thank you so much. And happy holidays to you, my friend. Uh, but another donation here from big country says, what's the next move? Not a pitcher without using the names, Chris Bryant or Correa. Cheers, gentlemen. Ooh. Okay. I mean, I think we can just focus pitching. I mean, Oh wait, not pitcher. I'm no, sorry. So no, I, pitch. I, I, no pitcher. Not pitcher. Yeah. Ooh. So okay. if they're, they're going to go for a regular player, how does 
going and getting Sean Manaya and Matt Chapman sound. Well, they he said not pitcher. Uh, well, all right. Well, don't worry about the pitching half. Like, okay, okay. Yeah. Just Matt, worry about Matt Chapman. Matt, yeah, Matt Chapman. How's yeah, that? For, for sign me up. Yeah. I, I would. I would love that. I mean, I. I do think that the Chapman possibility is lessened a little bit just because the Mets do have a short-term third base option now in Escobar. Yeah. I know that um, I'm pretty sure he's felt comfortable at second base, but um, if the Mets trade McNeil, it's a completely different ball game on how this infield is utilized in my opinion. And I do think that he's someone that can still be of consideration dealt wise, but I also know that there's a lot of risks if you trade McNeil, knowing that he's destined to bounce. I think he's destined to bounce back next he's, season. Just fine. He's hit. Three for his first three, you know, it was a partial seasons, but like he's hit up till this year, and this year was a bad year. I think uh, the injury he had was a little more than maybe was let on, and I think that may have impacted his play a bit. Jeff McNeil to me is like a prime bounce back candidate, so I'm not really in a rush to not be playing him. Uh, but you certainly have to weigh his relationship with Francisco Lindor. Is that a problem now? Did they just were they just two brothers that had a fight? Because I don't know if you have brothers, but um i do have a brother and yes yeah. we we do fight you we fight and then, and, then, and then you get over it the next day or whatever you get over it shortly thereafter so you hope it's more of that than there's a significant rift between them but uh yeah i think matt chapman would be like that short term third baseman he's got two years left i think of control yeah so, he's he's perfect i mean if you're looking defense alone there's oh, yeah, no one better that, position that, you wouldn't have a better left side of the infield in baseball than him and francisco lindor at shortstop um, but other than that, like for, there's no other, reg, like, I'm not really thinking regulars for the most part. And like you said, we can't use Brian or Correa. Uh, so who's this year's Kevin Pillar? Who's this year's Jonathan VR? Like, I don't have the free agent list in front of me, but find those people, like find the next quality fourth outfielder. And then, you know, kind of utility infielder. Those are kind of guys that I'd look at. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you for sure. And I mean, if there's anyone that I could see as a fourth outfielder that will, might surprise some people, you know, I think that there is potential. Don't necessarily see it being likely to start the season, but we we all know that clearly Nick Plummer are two guys that are going to be competing for a spot next year. Um, exactly how, what's the likelihood of them cracking the Mets lineup to start the season or at any point, you know, that has yet to be seen. But, you know, you know very well how dominant of a year Lee had, um, yeah. one of the best minor league outfielders in all the minors last year, and Nick Plummer, very sneaky pickup for the Mets that I think the Cardinals are going to look back on and say, oh, you know, we might have messed. I mean, they've had a history of messing up outfielders and, you know, evaluating them in recent years with the Randy Rosarenas and the um, the uh, shoot. Why am I blanking on the guy's name with the Texas Rangers right now? Um, Dude, Adonis well, Garcia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. so I mean, look, that we'll see. But uh, what what's your take on that, at least? Clearly, totally, totally agree. I think Plummer was a guy that they brought in and similar to like Sam McWilliams last year that they gave a big league deal. So that way they just made sure that they could get him. He has minor league options left. My expectation is Plummer will like compete, <laughs> I don't, uh, but he'll probably end up in AAA to open the year. To me, Khalil Lee, I don't know how much benefit he's going to get from, you know, you often say with young players, you want them in the minor league so they get more consistent at bats. Bingo. But I think you, you have Khalil Lee off the bench. He has some pop that like you saw him tap into a little more in the second half uh, for triple a he has great on base skills. He led all of minor league baseball, I think, or something like that. Certainly all of triple a in on base percentage. Uh, he just had a massive year in triple a. He had a bad short stint uh, for the big league team, but he can play all three outfield spots. He has a plus arm. Uh, he can run. He just has some contact issues. He'll still strike out a lot. Of, of course you saw that in that short spurt, but to me, he's a uh, every bit of a fourth outfielder with potential for more. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that one. I'm excited for Lee. I think he's really going to be a little bit of a pleasant surprise for the Mets next year, just like how Mark Vientos has that same potential, given his home run power, of course, you know, heading for the gap. But I'm going to address a couple more donations, and then we're going to wrap up the stream here, folks. Again, thank you all so much for the comments, questions, and concerns. It really does mean a lot. Um, Pet Mets, $10 donation. Thank you so much for that. Um, how about uh, how about tie DH to the pitcher? Pitcher out, DH out. Would end the opener, which I hate. Pitchers would be allowed to go longer, and it would be a nice compromise for NL fans. I've seen a proposal similar to this, if not the exact same, before. Um, for me personally, I mean, 
I want the DH like fully. I, I just I've always wanted the DH. That's something where it just it's always pissed me off to be honest. I'm not someone that looks at the AL and the NL. That's like, oh, you know, you have to respect the two leagues and the differences. No, screw that. I absolutely hate it. I've and, and again, I think it's something when I'm not a seasoned fan, baseball fan, like I know a lot of other people that are watching this are. So their take is vastly different than mine because they've had different experiences. But as a younger fan, at least from what I've experienced, I want things to be the same universally. Why do they need to be different? Especially when in the end, you're going to play someone for a championship from an opposing league that has had that benefit of having a power bat in their lineup every single game throughout a 162 season. I just think it's it extends careers and it also ends careers if you're in the NL. So, I mean, I want it universally. I, I This isn't a terrible proposal, but I still would want things full-fledged. Uh, what's your take? I want it full-fledged as well. It's not the worst idea in the world, like you said, but I, I want it full-fledged. And if there's anything that's being proven right now, Major League Baseball doesn't give a crap out th about their fans. So, um, you know, that's that's kind of what it is. They don't need they don't want to compromise for their fans. They're not concerned about that. No, I mean, if they want to compromise, we we wouldn't be in a lockout right now. But again, I'm not going to get on a tangent here. <laughs> uh, but OK, appreciate that. And Brennan, five dollar donation. Thank you again. Man Castillo and Sessa. OK, so you meant to say Castillo and the reliever uh, Luis Sessa, who was oh, with okay. the Yankees. That was trade there. OK, I mean, that that's far more far more realistic that makes than more Sonny sense. Gray and yeah. Castillo. So again, still steep. I think Castillo's price is just going to be too much for a Mets team to have enough interest given their current status of their farm. Yeah. I mean, if they could pull something where maybe Jeff McNeil is an X factor and they are able to address the infield in a different route, then I think go for it. I would imagine the Reds would have appeal to someone like Jeff McNeil, especially in that infield that's versatile, but has control until 2025. They clearly want young assets that are going to benefit them more so in the you know long term, and McNeil would certainly do that. Um, if that if he could be an X factor in acquiring Luis Castillo, I'm in favor of it because at the end of the day, as much as I love McNeil and what he normally brings as being a huge on base guy, you know, so versatile, you know, pitching wins championships, and I think what we've noticed too, especially with a Mets team that had and everything go wrong with them this past year, but. As soon as DeGrom was out, you know, that was it. You know, even with Marcus Stroman riding high and giving you six, seven solid innings every fifth day, Taiwan Walker's Jekyll and Hyde season cookie, I have no clue what to expect from him next year. You know, if the Mets are going to go all in on their rotation and have an offense that maybe won't be the best in the league, but will surely be competent enough to get them those clutch hits when they needed to, then I that's okay with me, especially because of Castillo's contract and what O'Brien, you know, he, I think he's going to be dominant for years to come. Yeah, no, I think that, that makes some sense. Uh, but if you're training Jeff McNeil, you better have that plan to fix that infield behind him because oh, absolutely, you don't do it unless you have something preset. Yeah, you're you're trading a potential impact bat, and if they do it and the whole plan comes together, they you know they trade Jeff McNeil to get Luis Castillo, and then they sign Chris Bryant and they shift Eduardo Escobar to second base, then, you know, we're cool. They got the rotation, they upgraded the lineup, uh, but you just, you just have to be prepared, obviously. Yep. No, exactly. And someone asked, sounds like Hefner stays as pitching coach. Yeah. He, yeah. Jeremy Hefner isn't going anywhere. It's already been announced. He's a so, yeah. Yeah. He, he's locked and loaded and rightfully so. I mean, he's been the one of the bright spots in this coaching staff, not, not to slight as much as we love the Dave Jouses of the role among others, but um, yeah, that's really going to wrap things up though, folks. I've went long over your time. I apologize. I tend to do that, especially when answering questions, but it's been a pleasure to have you on uh, the stream, Joe, especially breaking down all the lace with Buck and really just sharing thoughts on everything with the Mets right now. You know, I'm going to be doing a lot of this basically each week, having different guests on and stuff. So I'm sure it won't be the last time um, for a bit. Uh, but Joe, again, make sure to let everyone know where they can find you, uh, for, especially for people that are first chiming in the live stream right now. Yeah, uh, check me out on Twitter at PSL2Flushing, and that's T-O, not the number two. And it's uh, in the description below, yeah. just so yeah, you guys know. it's in the description, but PSL Flushing on Twitter. Um, check out my writing at SNY.TV. Uh, check out Mets Perspective on SNY.TV. That's the video series I do with Jacob Resnick. You know, Great have, series, by the way. Off. Thank you, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, we did that in season, so you could go back and look. We had interviews with Brett Beatty. We had interviews with Mark Vientos and other top prospects and, you know, front office personnel throughout the organization. Uh, check out That's So Mets podcast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get them. I do that with Connor Rogers. 
and check out the That's So Mets YouTube channel where we need a thousand subs. So we need like they need a thousand subs. We got like, they, they have like seven hundred plus. We have like around three hundred in the chat. If you guys all just go and yeah. sub right now, they hit every one of you one right, there, right now. Click sub and you won't regret it, and you'll see Wardy on our channel soon. But see yeah, exactly no, the best of both worlds, guys. Come on, yeah, make no. sure to check out the YouTube channel. They're doing great things there, and I'm excited to see the more interviews you guys are coming out with. You've done a great job. So I know you just had um, uh, what's his face? Uh, why am I Doug Williams, on. Doug Williams yeah. yes, that was yeah. really cool. Especially knowing you know he's not no longer with SNY, but by all means he's still heavily ingrained and sharing his Mets thoughts. That was a great job. So yeah, yeah. again, thank you guys all so much that chimed in. Hope you guys enjoyed Joe and I breaking down all the lace with the Mets. Stay tuned, more great content coming on the channel starting tomorrow again to that a player that we already discussed earlier in the live stream and yeah thank you all so much for the support folks really does mean the world for the donations everything cannot begin to tell you how much i really appreciate it. and if this is the last time that you guys are on the channel until after the holidays and have a great holiday you haven't had yours already and yeah that's it uh joe appreciate you so much and guys let's go mets